Good evening and welcome to our fourth study in seminar number 215. This is June 25, 2008, and I'm in Round Rock, Texas. Very delighted to be here with you this evening, and I'm so happy that you've made the ultimate sacrifice. Give up a little of your time for the study of God's Word. And I pray that you will be blessed tonight as we study because we have a fascinating study to examine called Vengeance is Coming. I want to take you to the computer screen and just um, remind you, if you have a cell phone, please turn it off. We don't want the wheels falling off the wagon. <laughs> I want to remind you that our next seminar study will be Sabbath morning, starting at 10 o'clock, and uh, then we will uh, have lunch together, and then there will be an afternoon study, uh, and that will conclude this seminar. So I hope that you will make plans and preparations to spend a few hours together with me on Sabbath so that we can examine uh, some of the more technical things that um, will be presented. And then uh, in our afternoon study, we'll take some questions and answers, or at least some questions. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if there are any answers. want to take you now to the body of our study tonight and um, sort of review a few things that we've already covered so that you can begin to see perhaps at, by the end of our study why God takes vengeance on the wicked. When a majority of people within a group or body of people become defiant towards the Holy Spirit, God deals with the situation by doing one of three things. I remembered something. He sends his prophets. Remember in Jeremiah, we read last night in chapter 25, for 23 years Jeremiah had been trying to get Israel to repent. If that doesn't work, he sends redemptive judgments. In fact, before Jesus fully destroyed Jerusalem through Nebuchadnezzar, he sent Nebuchadnezzar on two sieges, one in 605 and the, and the second in 598 B.C. And Israel, after two sieges, still did not repent, so he sent Nebuchadnezzar back in 586 B.C. and plowed the city completely under and tore down the temple and just demolished Jerusalem. So when a majority of people within any group, whether it be a country or a city or even the world, become defiant, God rises up and takes action. And he does this out of love. God's love for the oncoming generation is as strong and as dedicated and committed, even though they are not on earth at the moment. His love for the oncoming generation is equal to the current generation. And in order to prevent the current generation from totally ruining the oncoming generation, he steps in with these destructive acts. If you had a little child in your home and you knew that something was going to harm that little child as it grew up, wouldn't you take remedial action to eliminate the threat to your child's well-being? Well, sure. Any parent would do that that loves his children. And so God's wrath, God's um, justice, God's love 
all come in together and play together because he loves the oncoming generation as much as he loves the present generation. And when the present generation is like Sodom and Gomorrah, there's nothing more he can do with it. A majority of people are in defiance and the only thing to do is just to destroy it. Many people have said to me, Larry, what kind of God would tell Israel in ancient times to kill every man, woman, and child in a nation? Remember that was Saul's problem when he was told to destroy the, Amalek the Amalekites? But he didn't do it, you know. He spared the king and, and, and some of the sheep and the cattle and everything. When God's wrath reaches a certain point, his patience has run out because of defiance, and he moves for destruction, and he totally destroys. Pe many people just can't accept that, but that's what the Bible teaches. He destroyed the whole world in Noah's day, and only eight people, eight people, four men, four women, entered the ark. So when God sends his prophets, if that doesn't do the job, he will send redemptive judgments. And if that doesn't do the job, he raises up a destroyer, in this case, in Jeremiah 25, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar then brought destructive judgments on Jerusalem and totally obliterated it. Now sometimes God will send destructive judgments without sending a destroyer, but he will do uh, one or the other or both depending on what the situation warrants. The neat thing about the destruction of Jerusalem is that God called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. We saw that last night. Nebuchadnezzar did not know Jesus as the Most High God at the time. Nebuchadnezzar thought that Marduk, the god of the Babylonians, was the Most High God. But um, there is a God higher than Marduk. Aren't you glad to know that? Rebellion against the Holy Spirit is unforgivable, and here's why. The Holy Spirit is the only means through which we may arrive at a true knowledge of God. Now, Jesus said in John 16, 13, the Holy Spirit does not speak on his own own. He only speaks what he hears. Remember that? A lot of people have said to me in times past, you know, the Spirit said this to me, and the Spirit said this to me, and the Spirit said this to me, and I, that creates a big question mark in my mind, because the Spirit does not speak on his own. That's what Jesus said. He only speaks what he hears, and he brings that to us. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that Jesus speaks. In fact, in the book of Revelation, we're going to see on Sabbath, as in our studies, that the testimony of Jesus is actually Jesus speaking. And the Holy Spirit takes the words of Jesus and delivers it to 100, it's like 144,000 emails going out all at the same time. And God's servants, the prophets, the 144,000, are going to speak the testimony of Jesus. The words of Jesus. So the, uh, the unpardonable sin the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is unforgivable because the Holy Spirit is the only means through which we may arrive at a true knowledge and understanding of God. I'll say more about that later. And the Holy Spirit is the only means of communication with God. You shut off this process and what do you have? The Holy Spirit is given to every person at birth. God, the Holy Spirit, enters every person at birth, and his purpose for doing so is simple. He wants to bring everyone 
into a knowledge and love for God. That's his mission. Just as Jesus came to earth to save the world, the Holy Spirit comes to each of us to draw us into a knowledge and a love for God. Let me show you some interesting texts. Look at Genesis 6, verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. This, we're talking now in Noah's day. And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. I don't think his heart is very happy today when he looks down upon this planet. I don't think heaven is a really happy place as they observe what's going on on earth. As it was in the days of Noah, so it is at the coming of the Son of Man. So God said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. Then the Lord said, I've jumped now back up to verse 3, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. And then he told Noah, the days of mercy remaining would be 120 years. God says, My spirit will not contend with you forever. That was true then, it is true now. We cannot toy with God. He will not tolerate it. Once the Holy Spirit departs from a person, that person will have no further desire to please God, or for that matter, maintain interest in spiritual matters. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. The Bible says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are what? Foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The person without the Holy Spirit has no interest in God, and he can't understand or have interest in spiritual things. They make no sense. After the flood, God said to Noah, notice this promise, whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my promise, my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Now, you remember that promise of the rainbow, and when the Lord sees the rainbow, he remembers the, the covenant. He made a unilateral, one-sided covenant. God says, I'm making a promise to mankind. One-sided. It, it, it has no bearing on what you do or don't do. This is a one-sided promise. I promise you, I will never send a flood again to destroy the earth. A unilateral covenant. The Bible says the whole world at that time had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Now, why would they want a tower? <laughs> For fear of a flood. They were afraid of a flood. God had just said, I'm promising you I'll never do this again. We don't believe. We build a tower. So they decided to build a tower and make a name for themselves so that they would not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Verse 6, the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. 
Then notice 11 verse 7. God said, come, let us go down and confuse their language. Well, who was Jesus talking to? I think he's talking to the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image. Let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth and they stopped building the city. This is why it was called Babel because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. God confused the language, and God dispersed the people. Then, let me show you something. The plain of Shinar is somewhere up here, I'm guessing, about where Lebanon is today, somewhere south of Turkey, but north of Jerusalem, somewhere in that area. Mount Ararat, you know, where the ark landed, is right over here. So my guess is that they didn't wander too far, but they got to the plain of Shinar. And then they built the tower, and the Lord came down with the Holy Spirit's help, and he confused the language and gave everybody a different language. Now, one thing is very aggravating, trying to communicate with somebody who doesn't speak your language. You ever tried to do that? <laughs> it's frustrating. You can't understand, they can't understand. And it just brings com communication to a halt. The only reason we can all be in this room tonight is we all understand the same language. And when the people could not understand one another, there was no more construction. There was no more building. And God separated the families by language. And they departed one from another. People speaking the same language found each other and they moved on. They moved away. Well, after a few years... The families had moved far enough apart that God then did something. God pulled the earth apart. What he did, this was the, the earth was one land mass. And if you'll notice, this is South America. If you'll look at the coastline of South America, you can see how it would fit right into the coastline of Africa. Science, geoscientists have known for a long time that at one time, Earth was a solid landmass. And in the days of um, Peleg, God divided the Earth. The Bible says, Genesis 10, 25, two sons were born to Eber, now, Eber, you know, is a descendant of Noah. One was named Peleg, because in his time, the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. When God divided the earth, the kangaroos happened to be on this piece of land, and that's how they ended up indigenous to what we now call Australia. Kangaroos were moved from over here or over here down to there. God moved the whole earth. He pulled it apart. He divided up the earth. And John, speaking geographically, that had to be quite a thing to behold. John is a hydrologist and Tim is a hydrologist, I guess. And so you guys understand that there, this is an amazing thing that is considered here. And even the ridges in the oceans that have been photographed show how the, it, it, the evidence is very clear that the, there was a separation of the land masses. It's, a, it's truly an amazing thing to consider. And so God confused the languages 
That dispersed the people. And once they were far enough apart, he pulled the land mass apart. And that's how it came to be what we now have and what we call the seven continents of earth. Very remarkable concept. Well, after pulling the earth apart, God waited about 200 years. Then God chose Abraham, a man of faith, and his descendants to be missionaries to the world. Israel was chosen to be a light unto the Gentiles. Now, to the Jew, the word Gentile meant the ignorant ones. <laughs> the Jews called non-Jews Gentiles because they, they knew that they didn't have the knowledge of God that they had. So the Gentiles were the ignorant ones. And the Jews were the chosen ones. That's, that's how it came to be understood. Now, when God divided up the earth, he put some people on this continent called South America. He puts a few people on this continent called North America. He put some people on this continent called Africa. God had people on all these various continents. And this explains in the exploration that Columbus and others, you know, have done, Sir Walter Raleigh and all of these famous explorers, how that people were there when they got there. You know, Columbus discovered America. Well, how could that be when the people were here? <laughs> I would think it better said that the Americans discovered Columbus. He just showed up one day. And you know what's amazing? I won't go into all this. I don't have time tonight. But when Columbus got to the shores of America, the natives knew what day of the week it was. <laughs> Tell me how lost they were. <laughs> Yeah, they knew what day of the week it was, and they knew what month it was, and they had crops planted, and they were doing very well, thank you, until he got here. <laughs> Things went downhill from there. Israel was chosen to be the light to the Gentiles. Isaiah 42, verse 6, I, the Lord, this is Jesus speaking, Jehovah, I have called you, speaking to Israel, I have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. To open eyes that are blind. To free captives from prison. What's he talking about? What kind of blindness? What knowledge, what knowledge of God, true knowledge, is going to exist outside of revelation. I don't mean the book revelation. I'm talking about outside of divine revelation. What knowledge, what true knowledge of God exists? There is none. So when God divided the world in all of these pieces, and he scattered the people in the languages, he decided, I want a family of people to go out into the world as a light. I want them to take the truth and to show the Gentiles, the ignorant ones, my salvation. And so I want you to open their eyes. They have eyes but can't see. I want you to free the captives. They're, they're in the prison of sin. And I want you to set them free. And to release them from the dungeon, those who sit in darkness. Isaiah 42, 8. I, the Lord, that is my name, Jehovah. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Isaiah 49, 6. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. He repeats it again. That you may bring my salvation where? To the ends of the earth. That was the plan. God wanted a 
a family of missionaries to take salvation where? To the ends of the earth. The eternal gospel was set up as a living trust. A living trust requires three elements. You have to have a benefactor. In this case, God. God has the asset. It's called the gospel, the good news. The beneficiaries, mankind. And the trustee of the living trust, Israel. You understand? Israel is not the beneficiary. The ends of the earth is the beneficiary. Where is the gospel to go? To my knowledge, I don't believe Israel ever sent one missionary out. Maybe Jonah, but the Lord sent him to Nineveh, remember? He didn't want to go. But I, I honestly can't think of Maybe you can correct me if you can think of one. I'd like to know, but I do not know of one missionary Israel ever sent out. They all got together, you know, downtown Jerusalem. They liked Jerusalem food. They liked Jerusalem friends. They had Jerusalem talk. You know, they had their own language, their own lingo. lingo and they never got out of town. Why were they called in the first place? to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. They were to be a light. When Jesus shows up in the Sermon on the Mount, He says, you are the light of the world. Uh-oh. God wanted Israel to demonstrate as well as proclaim the gospel. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is also a way of life. It's a way of doing business. It's a way of living. It's a, it, in, it penetrates every part of life. Nothing escapes the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus is truth. It is true. It is pure. It is righteous. It is ennobling and transforming. <clears throat> The gospel can turn a mean-hearted person into a saint having a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The gospel can turn a violent person into a selfless saint. Look what Paul wrote to Timothy. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted how? in ignorance and unbelief. The life of Paul is one of the most selfless lives outside of that of Christ in the Bible. The gospel can turn a hard-hearted tyrant into a thoughtful, loving, caring saint. Blessed are the meek, Moses, for they will inherit the earth. Moses was a murderer, remember? He killed that Egyptian. But the gospel of Jesus, when he met Jesus in the wilderness, changed everything. The point here is that God wanted Israel to demonstrate as well as proclaim the gospel to a world in darkness. Now, three points I want you to consider. God does not condemn any person because they are ignorant of his ways and truth. Let me say that again. A God of love does not condemn any person because they are ignorant of his ways and truth. God loves the heathen just as much as he loves the saints. God loves the oncoming generation just as much as He loves the current generation. For God so loved the world. Well, at what time did He love the world? <laughs> well, was it just the people, you know, in 3985 B.C. that He loved? What about the people in 2008 A.D.? 
No, God's love is for those that aren't here as well as those that are here. God loves the heathen. And that's why he, the gospel is set up as a living trust. The beneficiaries are the ends of the earth. And the trustees are to carry God's grace, God's love, God's the truth to the ends of the earth. Notice how this works in Acts 10.34 when Peter is sent to the home of Cornelius, a Gentile. <gasps> you know, Peter wouldn't even go to Cornelius' house by himself for fear of being contaminated by a Gentile. You know, Gentiles don't eat what we eat. <laughs> so Peter gathered up some friends to go to Cornelius' house. And when Peter got there, Peter made a confession. Peter began to speak. He said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Boy, for a Jew to say that was, whoa. Whoa. You don't realize the significance of those words until you understand Judaism. I now realize that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear Him and do what is right. Boy, for a Jew to say that was awesome. Jesus said in John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay my life down for the sheep. Then in verse 16, Jesus says to the Jews that are sitting around him, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. Look, all over the world at any given time, God has people he calls his children. Many of them don't even know him. But you know what? They are not defiant to the Holy Spirit, and that qualifies them as a child of God. That is the mercy and love of God. Jesus said, I have sheep that are not of Israel's sheep pen." And he goes on to predict, I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd eventually. That's going to happen finally in the great tribulation. It's all going to come together. I'll explain that more Sabbath when we study. In Romans 2 verse 6, God's, Paul writes, God will give to each person according to what he has done. There's that done word again. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But glory honor and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. The reason Paul is putting this first for the Jew and then for the Gentile is that the, the Jews should know better. They've been given more knowledge. Therefore, accountability and responsibility and the effect of the, of the gospel should be theirs. If you live according to the gospel, you're going to benefit you're going to be blessed. You're going to have a better life than someone who lives in ignorance of the gospel. Because the gospel is ennobling. It is uplifting. It is transforming. And it draws us into a communion with God. So Paul says, look, if anyone is self-seeking and he rejects the truth, defiant, and he follows evil, there will be wrath and anger, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for who? <laughs> those who know better. And then, of course, for those who know less. 
But there will be glory, honor, and peace for everyone for who does good. First for those who know better, and then for the ignorant. For God does not show favoritism. All who sin. Now listen carefully. Paul's writing sometimes a little tough to, to, to get through, but it's critical. All who sin apart from the law. What he's saying here, people, people who don't know about the law, but who sin anyway. In other words, let's suppose um, someone down here in Borneo doesn't know that the commandment says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay? He, he sins without any knowledge that there's even a Ten Commandments. Well, the Bible says here, he's going to perish apart from the law. In other words, his wife's going to kill him anyway. <laughs> Whether it was written in the Ten Commandments or not is immaterial. When you violate basic law of behavior, you pay the penalty. All who sin apart from the law will perish apart from the law. And all who sin having knowledge of the law will be judged and condemned by the law. In other words, God judges those who know and those who don't know the same way. It all depends on your response to the Spirit. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Now, you could look at that verse, and if that was the only verse in the Bible, you could get a very legalistic slant on things. You know, that's why you have to take all that the Bible says about things to get the balance. What Paul is saying here is that it's not just hearers of what God wants that are declared righteous, but it is those who submit to God's authority who will be declared righteous. Look at verse 14. Paul says, Indeed, when the Gentiles, now we're talking about the ignorant people, when the Gentiles who do not have the law or any knowledge of it, when they do by nature the things required by the law, in other words, this person down here in Borneo, he does by nature. He says, I know it's wrong to commit adultery. I'm not going to commit adultery. But he doesn't know about the Ten Commandments. But he is not going to commit adultery because he knows within his heart it's wrong. And his wife will confirm that, if there's any doubt. Paul says, when the Gentiles who do not have the law, knowledge of the law, do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. See, God judges the people who don't know on the basis of what they are convicted on, convicted on by the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. Thirty years ago, I didn't believe what I now believe. My understanding of God and His Word 30 years ago was much different than it is today. But I can tell you this. My confidence in Jesus Christ as my Savior has not changed. Although my understanding has made an incredible change. I've had a complete paradigm shift. But my salvation has not changed because I've been following the Spirit ever since I became a born-again Christian. And you know something? If I live to be 300 years old, I expect more changes are coming. God does not judge me on the basis of what I know or don't know. He judges me on the basis of my response to the Holy Spirit. That's called living by faith. And when God calls you to do something, you always get the privilege of doing it alone. <laughs> You're the only guy on earth that can see it this way. 
That's what living by faith is. And you've got to step out, and you've got to follow the Spirit's demand. Paul goes on to say, look, they are a law unto themselves even though they don't have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. How did it get there? Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There's no other way. Their consciences also bearing witness. That is, they have some knowledge, they have some conviction in their conscience as to what is right and what is wrong. Every society has some mores of what is right and what is wrong. Where did that come from? Did man just sit around and say one day, well, guys, let's get together and decide what right and wrong is. What an interesting discussion this will be. No. God gives the Holy Spirit to everyone so that we can grow up in maturity, in closer communion and knowledge of our Creator, Jesus Christ. So their consciences bear witness and their thoughts now accusing when they do wrong, although they know nothing about the law, they just know it was wrong. And even defending them when they see that they are honoring God. You know, one of the most beautiful things that you can in a child is when a child doesn't know what to do in a situation and the child makes the best decision that they can and the parent comes in and, 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 and sees the decision that's been made and then when you see how carefully the child tried to figure out what to do, what does the parent do? You did the best you could. I love you. What is more pleasing than to see a child do the best they can do? Even though it's not absolutely right, or it may not even be best, given our advanced knowledge. So children are little Gentiles. Bless their little ignorant hearts. <laughs> but they learn. They grow. And their sense of right and wrong unfolds as they grow up. And then Paul goes on to say, look, all of this will be proven on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, just as my gospel declares. In Romans 3.29, is God the God of the Jews only? Is He not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Dear friends, salvation comes through faith. Ephesians 2.8 For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. So contrary to what many Christians believe, God does not condemn any person to eternal death because that person lived and died without hearing about the salvation offered by Jesus Christ. Millions, get this, millions will be resurrected and taken to heaven who never heard one word about Jesus Christ and His death on the cross. Zechariah 13, 6 says, Someday when this is all over, people will come up to Jesus and they're going to say, what are these wounds on your body? And he will answer, the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Jesus separated the people of earth at the Tower of Babel, and he takes full responsibility for the spiritual darkness that resulted. When people were spread all out, their knowledge of God dimmed over time. The devil went to work and heathenism and paganism and atheism just flourished. But God says, I can deal with that because 
I know the hearts of every person. The Holy Spirit is within every person, and I will judge every person based on their response to the Holy Spirit. And I can measure that response by what they have done. Jesus called Abraham and his descendants to be trustees of the gospel, and this turned into a 1,500-year disaster. And at the end of the 1,500 years, God abandoned the biological offspring of Abraham as trustees of his covenant and started over by redefining Israel. There's a new Israel now. Let me show you what he said, the benediction to the, for the old Israel. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I long to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, behold your house. Your nation is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The new Israel that has been defined is described in Galatians 3.28. I'll read this text and we'll take an intermission. Paul says that there is neither Jew nor Greek. Look at this. Yes, I was just seeing if you were still awake. <laughs> there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, if you have the privilege of knowing Him, if you have the joy of knowing Him, you have become a light. You have become a trustee of the gospel. If you have had the privilege of knowing Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter your origin. It doesn't matter your sex, male or female. It doesn't, nothing matters because now you are a light. You are a trustee. Then you are Abraham's seed and an heir of what was promised to Abraham. The Greek word for seed here is sperma, sperm. You are Abraham's sperm and heirs according to the promise. So Jesus called Abraham and his descendants to be trustees of his gospel. And this turned into a 1500 year disaster. And at the end of the 1500 years, God abandoned the biological offspring of Abraham as trustees of his covenant. And he started over all together by redefining Israel with a new covenant. And since A.D. 34, the expiration of the 70 weeks, the trustees of the gospel have been Christians. And the really bad news, I like to end on doom. <laughs> Christians have managed to mangle the gospel of Jesus into so much conflict that you can hardly find two Christians today who can agree on what the gospel really says. And on that cheerful note, we'll take a five-minute intermission.